Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is James Byrne, author of the new novel, The Gatekeeper. Greg Hurwitz, New York Times bestselling author of the Orphan X series, wrote about The Gatekeeper. What a welcome blast of freshness James Byrne's The Gatekeeper is to the world of thrillers. Great plot, great pacing, and a voice that jumps off the page. Most essentially, it's charming as hell, which makes for a delightful read. Let's hope we're lucky enough to get plenty more of Des Limerick's unique brand of gritty troubleshooting and future tomes. James, welcome to the podcast. Really glad to be here, Jeff. This is awesome. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, The Gatekeeper, how would you describe the novel? Well, it's an action adventure thriller. Uh, my, I'm a mystery writer by uh, history, and my pivot foot is still fully in the mystery realm. But this story takes place in Los Angeles. And it's the story of a fellow who has retired from a military agency, I don't say which one, at 35. And he's traveling around Los Angeles with a guitar, looking to have some fun and staying out of trouble. And in fact, he's really, really bad at staying out of trouble. Trouble finds him. And so by chapter one, he's in the midst of uh, trouble that just escalates for the rest of the book. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write The Gatekeeper? Yeah, and it's really, really fascinating. I went through a dozen iterations of this character. Uh, at one point, he was uh, in his 50s. And at one point, he was um, like a cowboy character, a guy who'd grown up on the U.S.-Mexico border. And at one point, he'd been a cop. At one point, he'd been a criminal. Eventually, he became none of those things. Um, and I finally settled on uh, Des as an Englishman uh, who is um, powerfully built, strong fellow, but also very amiable and who just really, really is enjoying his life a great deal. This is the least angsty hero you're ever going to read in one of these books. This guy is basically just having a hell of a lot of fun. And once I figured that out, then I was able to figure out his name. And once I figured out his name, then I figured out his voice and all of the other cold starts that I tried that I never got more than five, six, eight pages into them because they were just wrong. All of a sudden, the pages were just flowing. And I'm curious, what kept you coming back to to kind of this character, this idea to try it so many different ways? This is kind of my method. Now, I don't outline and I'm a, I am I write every single day. I'm a very I'm a very uh, studious writer, but I'm also lazy in my habits in that I don't outline. And um, I just thought. There's going to be a really cool nugget of a character in here. I just know it. I got to find him. And if, until I do find him, he's going to just bug. He's going to be in my dreams. He's going to be well, hovering around while I'm eating breakfast. So I'm just going to try and try and figure out who this guy is. And um, if I didn't do that, he'd still be annoying me. So I'm really glad I stuck with it. <laughs> so in terms of your process, as you said, you, you, you don't do a, a lot of outlining. W what does that look like for you? Do you end up riding your way down kind of um, plot holes or, or, or having to back up or throw things away. How does that work exactly for you? For certain. And my wife jokes about the 40 page cul-de-sac that I'll get myself stuck in. Um, basically I'm an ex theater geek. And so I write in act one, act two and act three. And I always know sort of the big plot points of act one, act one where you introduce the plot, the settings, the main characters. And I know the big, big, bombastic thing in act two that really jumpstarts the plot and really gets a roaring forward. But I don't know how the books end very often. So I will get writing and see if it seems like I'm in a zone and see if it's fun. And I will know the difference if it is or isn't because I just will, uh, I'll be listless if it's not quite working. I'll say, nah, no, nah, that's wrong. I have to try that or start that back again and, and give it another shot. Um, and with uh, the iteration I finally came upon on this one, the pages just flowed. I, I should tell uh, your your listeners that I write longhand in a steno pad in first drafts because I'm a journalist. I'm a newspaper man. And I've been in 12 billion school board and county commission meetings writing things longhand. So that's my my preferred mode. And I'm curious, are you inspired by Elmer Leonard? Because I know he was one who, who wrote longhand. <laughs> I I, I would not in one instance have my name said in the same sentence with the great Elmore Lent. He's just one of the great writers of all time. Uh, and I just, I admire him tremendously. I too attempt to be humorous. I too attempt to get some, some uh, lightness into what are otherwise 
pretty could be otherwise really really dark stories but i mean he was the master sure sure and and how does that work for you do you do you write the whole book that way or do you write a chapter and then go to the computer um how, what's your process like it makes me really fast i will write a chapter or how much time i have in the morning longhand then in the evening i'll go and i'll put that in the computer and you know, eight, 10 hours will have passed. My day job will have passed. And I will be able to tell right away, is that stuff good or is that stuff not good? I can do a diagnostic and same day diagnostic and think, yeah, you know, that's pretty, that's a fun scene that, that carried the freight that it needed to carry, be it plot or character or element or some, whatever it needs to carry. Or I'll say, nope, nope, didn't work, didn't work, don't even bother. But because I can do that and because I can do same day diagnos diagnosis, it makes me a pretty fast writer. I can write a 300 page book in, um, three months. And, and so are you, it sounds to me like you're, you're still working as a journalist. Is that correct? I am. I work here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I, I work for the Portland Tribune newspaper, uh, having just a tremendous amount of fun, loving, loving my day job. And how did you, um, originally, uh, make the shift into writing, uh, novels and getting your first novel published? That's a really dopey, dopey story. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed about it. My dad was a huge fan of like mis uh, I classic iconic thrillers like Bo Jest, uh, The Four Feathers, those stories. Dad loved that stuff. So dad passed the love of that writing on to me. And then when I attended a community college here in Oregon, Clackamas Community College, I thought, you know, I'm going to try my hand at writing a novel because I enjoy them. So I literally sat down and tried to write a novel. And I did. And it was dreadful. Um, it lacked a couple of <laughs> somewhat important elements. It didn't have like a character or a plot. But other than that, you know, I, I proved to myself that I could literally generate that many pages. And so while that one was dreadful, it did give me the impetus to go ahead and try and write another one that was uh, a bit better, God willing. And I got that one published uh, while I was still a student in college. So I got super lucky on that one. And then uh, I have had a number of books published under a couple of different pseudonyms ever since. And uh, when Des comes out, it'll be uh, book number 10 for me. And I'm curious, have you started working on another Des novel now? The second one is done and it's with my editor. I have to say my editor is Keith Kayla and he is at Minotaur St. Martin's Press. And for my money, he is the best in the business. He's tremendous. He's the guy who will look at your manuscript and say, you know, on page 30, you do that scene with such and such. Can you do it from the other person's POV? Because on page 314, we're going to need her to know something. I mean, he can see the story at the 30,000 foot level and he can see the story on a granular level and he can see it all. And beyond all of that, he's also a very, very funny wise ass who has an infinite knowledge of 1980s television and is just funny as heck. And <laughs> it's a really, I mean, he makes my books better. And this will be the uh, fifth book I've done with Keith. Uh, the, the next one uh, is done and he has it. And I'm about 200 pages into book three. That's great. Well, given your experience writing novels, but also your day job as a journalist, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? One is this, if anybody ever tells you, you must always do this because every novelist does, or you must never do such and such, you should ignore that because everybody has a zone. And when you find your zone and it's going to work for you, ah, oh, that's awesome. Uh, my wife loves to write in coffee shops. She gets a, an excitement and a vibe when she's in a coffee shop that she can't write anywhere else quite like that. I had a friend who only wrote in his basement with the windows closed and he couldn't have any external noise whatsoever. I come out of newsrooms, so I like noise. I can write in airport uh, terminals and in airplanes. Uh, and I also listen to a lot of music when I, when I play. Um, what, I, I write in steno pads. Other people write in legal pads. Some write on a, uh, a, an Apple or a Mac. Whatever you use, if you find the one that works for you, that works, that, that, that makes you creative, that's the way you should write. Write in the mornings, write in the afternoons, write where it's loud, write where it's quiet. Whatever it is, if you find your zone where you think the copy is really just flowing, then that's the way you should write. Because if it's not fun, if it becomes a chore, if it becomes, God, I got to get home and feed the kids and empty the cat box and write chapter five, then I think you're in trouble. So, so I'm curious, you talked about this um, experience in college where you wrote this novel and you discovered that you could write that length and that number of pages. But as you said, it wasn't 
uh, the best novel ever written. Uh, what 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 process did you go through to get yourself to writing a book that was publishable? Um, I um, stopped reading mysteries and thrillers and started breaking them. I would go and pick up a book that I thought was really great, Robert B. Parker, and I'd say, why does it work? And I would literally buy used copies so I could scribble in the margins, put post-it notes in it, say, uh, where does he reveal what the actual plot is? And where does he reveal the antagonist? And where does he reveal what the crime was? And how did that work? And how did he structurally do it? And I started breaking it. And I would do it with movies I really liked, too. I'd find a movie that I thought was was really well-crafted. I'd say, okay, where do we meet the protagonist? Where do we meet the antagonist? Where do we know the the fake plot? Where do we know the real plot? And we have a reveal. How does that stuff work? So I started breaking stories and thinking, okay, okay, I can see how that works. That makes sense to me. And then sat down to try and write myself a murder mystery. I should also tell your listeners that I am, I was then and am now an avid comic book fan. And I learned a lot of storytelling from comic book writers and comic book artists who are tremendously good uh, shorthand storytellers. In one panel of a comic book, you have to have a specific action. You can't have two or three actions. So you learn to do as a shorthand uh, flow of, of, of ideas and visuals. So I learned a lot from that medium. And I've learned from movies I've enjoyed and breaking down stories to try to figure out when they work and how they work. And just, uh, I have a pretty good work ethic because writing is so much fun for me. So I write more or less every day of my life. Hey, this is Jeff from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Do you know what I love when I'm reading a great new book? A cup of tea. It's such a fun ritual. Settling down with a cup of tea and a new novel that I'm excited to read. Why not treat yourself to a cup of plum deluxe teas? Every loose leaf tea is hand blended, fresh, using only the best ingredients. From bold black teas to relaxing herbal blends, incredible dessert teas, or fun floral flavors, there's a delicious tea waiting for you. And I'm not making this up. They have a flavor of tea called Reading Nook Blend Black Tea. It's a tea that pairs perfectly with reading, writing, and relaxing. Plum Deluxe is a family-owned business, and they have one of the best selections of delicious, flavorful herbal teas, as well as bold black tea flavors. Visit PlumDeluxe.com slash listen and use the promo code RWP to save 12% on your first order. Tea also makes a great gift. That's PlumDeluxe.com slash listen. And use the promo code RWP. There's nothing better than enjoying a great cup of tea with a good book. And now you can get your great tea from PlumDeluxe.com. Target has laundry day covered because they offer a great selection of concentrated Tide Pods to help with all your laundry needs. Tide Pods clean, freshen, and help rejuvenate your clothes with odor fighters and stain removers. Did you know Tide Pods clean better than the leading liquid bargain detergent? Tide Pods are powerful enough to make your whites white and your brights bright, even in cold water. Just toss in one Tide Pod for small loads, two for medium, three for large. It's that easy. For great value and convenient pickup options, get Tide Pods today at Target. And I'm I'm curious with the comic books, are there um, comic books that you're reading now or series that you really enjoy and would recommend? Yeah, Brian Michael Bendis, who is a Portland author, uh, who would, he was an independent writer for a long time. Then he was a Marvel for a long time. Then he was at DC for a long time. And he wrote a series of independent books, one called Powers, that imagines the world of superheroes as seen by the cops in a specific precinct. Um, so nobody has, nobody they know has a cape, but they're constantly ha- having to rush to stories of, of apartment buildings that have been knocked over by people with capes. That was a tremendous idea for a book. I thought that was just uh, a knockout. I really liked that a lot. And then of late, I found myself going back to some classic, classic comic books I read uh, when I was a little kid and rereading some of the ones that were influential to me back then. A guy named Jim Aparo was the classic Batman artist of the 1970s. And I've been going back and and looking at some old stuff and reminding myself 
what it was like to be 13 and read that story and, and why it was thrilling then. And they go, oh, I can still, I can still access 13 year old James and, and, and find that thrill in, in that really classically well-told story again. So I've been doing that a lot. And um, I'm curious, have you ever written a comic book script? Unsuccessfully, yes, I have. I have <laughs> um, uh, to. They're one of the companies, one of the big ones, one of the three biggies are right here in Portland, Oregon, is Dark Horse Comics. I have yet to crack the code. I have yet to get a sale. Um, but uh, gosh, I would love to. That would be that would be gravy. That would be awesome. That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? I just read a book. Um, and the author's name is going to escape me. I'm going to be so embarrassed. And it was a strange book that I should not have liked. And I really, really did. It was called, um, um, uh, the, the golem and the genie. That's about, it's a realistic mysticism. It's about a golem, a creature of clay and a genie, a creature of smokeless fire who both find themselves marooned in New York in the 1920s. And it's really the story about strangers in a strange land and being an immigrant and not knowing the rules and not know and how do you find out what the rules are and how do you find a way of fitting in? It just happens to be two iconically uh, um, alien creatures, but but the story itself is super duper human. And boy, that was just a lovely, lovely read. Um, I had been reading Mark Greeny's um, uh, The Gray Man series because he's terrific. I read um, um, uh, Greg's um, uh, Orphan X series. is absolutely mm-hmm. terrific. Meg Gardner has written several books uh, on the X sub series. And this summer, she and Michael Mann are co-writing Heat 2, a prequel and sequel to the classic movie Heat that Michael Mann wrote and directed. And I am uh, I am blindingly jealous of my dear, dear friend Meg for this. What an opportunity. Yeah, that's that's great movie. I watch it about once a year. Yep. Yeah. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your new novel, The Gatekeeper? It's uh, James Byrne Mystery, which is all one word. Byrne is B-Y-R-N-E. So jamesburnmystery.com is my website. And um, uh, my books are, uh, there are links on my website to all the places one can find uh, The Gatekeeper. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with James Byrne, author of the new novel, The Gatekeeper. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And James, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, man, this was so much fun. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Des sits in a compound on the coast of Algeria. His back is to the door of a great house, and his eyes are on the gate to the manor's walled grounds. He has recently ushered 14 mates through that gate into the compound, and then through the door into the house. What they do inside is not his concern. The door and the gate are. The compound is outside Oran and consists of the massive old house, four stories tall, with white sandstone walls and the ubiquitous, sooty, dusty red terracotta roof of that coastal region of Algeria. The compound is surrounded by a wall, six meters high, crenellated in the old Moorish and French styles. The walkways atop the wall are lined with twelve earthen pots all hand-fired a deep cinnamon, and filled with flowering bougainvillea. The pots, each the size of a smart car, were placed up there a decade ago, so that riflemen could hide and shoot down and inward at marauders who'd breached the gate. The grounds are a lovely mosaic of green grass laced with winding pathways of crushed white seashells. In the rear of the compound is a garage large enough for the owner's fleet of eleven vintage automobiles. Outside the garage, the grounds are spacious enough to park twenty sedans, which the owner, Jamel Emboli, often does when hosting like-minded criminals, or Euro-trash narcotics enthusiasts, or those who wish to monetize terrorism. Dez and his mates arrived in Iran, individually or in groups of two spaced out over three days and two nights. They came by boat and train and jitney. Fourteen men, one woman. Some of them had worked together before. Others were strangers. They come from eleven different countries, speaking about a dozen languages. But all of them understand English. So that's their language for this job. Des has his eyes on the gate to the grounds and the door to the house. 
the gate into the grounds and the door to the house, are both painted red. While they belong to Jamel and Bully, right now Dez owns them both. He is the gatekeeper. Dez is powerfully built, but not all that tall. He has sandy hair and ruddy, pinkish skin. He wears a black and white checkered kefir, plus fatigues the color and pattern of oil fire smoke. When Dez hears the first pop, pop, pop of small arms fire from inside the house, he thinks, well, there goes plan A. Now he can hear cars roaring up the dusty old cliffside road. More than four, as many as seven. Lots of cars, with men carrying assault weapons, he assumes. A tall and gangly man, known by some as Rafik, has been guarding the interior side of the front door of the manor house, as Dez has been guarding the exterior. Rafik steps outside now, dressed much like Dez. He's rail thin, with a thick, matted beard and skin burned to dinosaur hide by desert work. He says, Cars. Dez checks the connections to the remote control in his lap. He's got great night vision. He says, I. There's shooting inside. They ran into Oppo. I. Wasn't supposed to be no Oppo inside the house, chef. I. We get caught in a crossfire. All hells to pay. Dez nods, but does not get up off his butt. Rafik points to the remote. What's that? Dez squints up at him. Borrowed a couple of batteries from Monsieur Emboli's fleet of cars. Also borrowed one of his lawn sprinklers. Buying us some time, should we need it. We safe to stay here, chef. Safe is a relative word. True, Rafik says, scratching his beard. And now they both hear more of it. More opposition than their intelligence told them to expect inside the house. Then again, shooting inside, cars arriving outside, starting to haunt up a little, n'est-ce pas? Dez nods, but he still doesn't rise. They hear a scrambling and the squeak of rubber soles on tile, and four of their mates burst out of the house, sweating, all dressed much like Dez and Rafik. Two of them are carrying a filing cabinet horizontally, like a coffin. Thank you for listening to this clip provided to you by Macmillan Audio. To hear more, look for this title wherever audiobooks are sold. Target has laundry day covered because they offer a great selection of concentrated Tide Pods to help with all your laundry needs. Tide Pods clean, freshen, and help rejuvenate your clothes with odor fighters and stain removers. Did you know Tide Pods clean better than the leading liquid bargain detergent? Tide Pods are powerful enough to make your whites white and your brights bright, even in cold water. Just toss in one Tide Pod for small loads, two for medium, three for large. It's that easy. For great value and convenient pickup options, get Tide Pods today at Target.